Listener Production. Hey, welcome to The Briefing. Sasha Barber-Gab with you. Should we be worried about bird flu? Seven farms in Victoria, two in New South Wales and one in WA have been quarantined after outbreaks of the highly infectious disease. There's no evidence that the types of virus that have been detected in the flocks in New South Wales, Victoria or Western Australia are so-called human pathogens. They are strictly bird affecting flus. There have been reports that there can be some transmission to humans but very, very rare. In today's deep dive, we get the latest on bird flu in Australia and what risks it poses to our farmers, the food we eat and us. First, though, let's get into the headlines with Helen Smith. It is Tuesday, the 25th of June. Morning, Sash. The federal government has announced a watered-down version of its vape ban, which will see products continue to be sold, but only in pharmacies. So to secure the support of the Greens in the Senate, Labor has agreed to backtrack on its prescription-only model. That has been due to start on July 1, which is next Monday. Instead, vapes will be made available at pharmacies across the country, but they will need to be regulated and subjected to plain packaging requirements with flavour is limited to mint, menthol or tobacco. Mm, It is a pretty big backtrack by the health minister. It was sold to us as a total ban. This will be available to anyone who's over 18 and they're going to open it up as well to people under 18 if it's deemed necessary by a physician. Here's exactly what Mark Butler told us in an interview back in March. Vaping is still a relatively new product. We think we still have the chance to stamp it out as a recreational product. And we're taking that chance now. And I think since we've announced the measures, you've seen other countries who had originally been, I think, taken by the suggestion from industry that we should just regulate this product like we do cigarettes. I think they're coming around to the idea that, no, actually, we need to take a much heavier hand with vapes. And in a new statement released yesterday, Butler said these new amendments will return vapes to their original purpose That is an aid to quit smoking. Now, the amendments to this bill, which have been negotiated between Labor and the Greens, won't actually come into effect until the 1st of October. That's been designed to give pharmacies the time to develop clinical advice. So I think there's going to be an attempt, you know, some of the reporting saying that, you know, if someone comes in and says, I'd like a vape, they'll be like, oh, well, have you tried patches or have you tried lozenges Mm. to quit? You know, are you trying to quit smoking? So there's going to need to be new advice developed for pharmacists in this space. Uh, I do think it will help stop casual vapors because the way that you access them at the moment is you're out in the city. We work in the city, Helen. All around us are tobacconists. And mm. you think of people out on a on a Friday night having a few drinks, like, yeah, why not? I'll go grab a vape. It's $25. It's easy for me to access. Pharmacies, most pharmacies aren't open that late. You can't grab them on a night out. And the environment, you know, Mark Butler talked as well about, you know, putting them in a clinical environment where it's like, you know, you treat it like medicine. You have to go up to the pharmacist. So I do think it'll help stop casual vapors from actually buying them. Victoria will launch a pill testing trial this summer with the trial endorsed by Cabinet yesterday. The announcement was made by Victorian Premier Jacinta Allen last night on social media with a press conference today set to give us some further details on how it will work. It doesn't make pills legal, but it does keep people safe. It exists around the world and the evidence says it works. This is a simple and common sense way to save lives. That's why we're going to trial it in Victoria this summer. The decision follows Labor's previous stance against pill testing and the party also didn't support a second safe drug injecting room in Melbourne CBD. This was despite experts' advice saying it would help reduce fatal heroin overdoses. This trial comes after Jacinta Allen also said in that social media video that Victorian paramedics responded to more overdoses at festivals in the first three months of this year, 2024, than they did during all of 2023. So if this can help, then that's going to be a big relief on health workers, Mm. on those first responding paramedics at those festivals, because it's quite a confronting scene and if it can make people safer when they're 
at festivals or trying to have fun, I, I think it's only going to be a good thing. Yeah, well, there's proof. There's there's trials and studies from overseas where this has been happening for a while now that show that it does it works when it comes to harm minimization. So I watched the video as well and the Premier said it doesn't make drugs legal. There is no safe drug. We can never say that this drug is safe, but it allows people to know what is in their pills, what is in the substances that they're taking and then make an informed decision. Mm. People are going to do drugs. Kids are going to do drugs. Why not make it safer for them? I think this is a long time coming and something advocates are going to be happy with. Uh, Now, you know, Queensland has already got pill testing trials kind of happening and underway. Uh, New South Wales is due to have a big drug summit in October. There has been pressure for the state government in New South Wales to follow suit and put in pill testing trials. Hopefully we'll see some movement in New South Wales as well soon. Princess Anne is in hospital after she was injured on the Gatcom Park estate. In a statement, Buckingham Palace confirmed the 73-year-old suffered a concussion and minor head injuries, but is expected to make a, quote, swift and full recovery. How she was injured hasn't been revealed, but the BBC is reporting the injuries could have been caused by a horse. The palace did go on to say that the king's been kept closely informed and he joins the whole royal family in sending his fondest love and well wishes to the princess for a speedy recovery. Uh, Sounds like she's going to be fine, Helen. It's worth noting, though, I think the royals will feel her loss while she recovers from this because she's regularly described as the hardest working royal. According to the court circular, she carried out 457 engagements in 2023. That's more than one a day. I don't know how the woman fits it in. I hope she, I'm sure, you know, it might be like, oh, she walked past, you know, a school and waved to the children one engagement. But still... That's a lot of work that she does. So, yes, wishing the princess all the best. She's doing the best work. And I always see compilations of her on TikTok being like, just out there riding her horse, you know. She competed in the Olympics in equestrian yeah. and everyone's like, she's our queen. And I'm just <laughs> like, I, I love Princess Anne. So, yeah, wishing her well. And a number of Picasso paintings are now hanging in the women's toilets at Tasmania's Mona after a court ruled it had to let blokes into the ladies' lounge. So the exclusive room, an art installation, was meant to symbolise women's experience of exclusion in the world by turning the tables and keeping men out. But someone complained and in April, the Tasmanian Civil and Administrative Tribunal ruled it was discriminatory. Yeah, so it's been closed ever since. That happened back in March. Now the artist behind it, Kersha Cashel, has confirmed some of Mona's Picasso collection is hanging in the cubicle of a women's toilet. Now, it's worth noting, so uh, Cashel put up a Instagram post yesterday announcing this and she said... I just didn't know what to do with all those Picassos talking about when the ladies' lounge closed. So I love this. It is worth noting as well that the decision um, by Tazcat is currently being appealed in the Supreme Court. And uh, Cashel has said that they will get the lounge open again. She's pursuing it under the Anti-Discrimination Act, which is what the ladies' lounge was closed under initially for being discriminatory to men. But she says she can open it up again as a church, a school, a boutique glamping across accommodation uh, under Section 26, which allows places to discriminate based on gender for certain reasons. Uh, So go Cashel. I love this. Helen, thanks so much for being here for the headlines. Next up, it's our deep dive, getting you across everything you need to know about bird flu. You might have heard the words bird flu buzzing around over the last few weeks. Ten farms across Victoria, WA and New South Wales have reported outbreaks, resulting in hundreds of thousands of chickens being euthanised. Avian influenza can be devastating for farmers and even the economy. Already, limits have been placed on how many eggs we can buy at the supermarket. But there is also a risk of the flu passing from birds to humans, with symptoms being detected in people in the US as it deals with its own outbreak. So, should we be worried? Enzo Palombo is Professor of Microbiology at Swinburne University and he joins me now. Professor, thanks so much for your time today. I suppose the first question we need to get out of the way is how worried does the general population need to be about these outbreaks? My 
main concern would be more around the supply of the of eggs, for example, in, in the outbreaks that have occurred so far. Most have been restricted to egg laying flocks. I think the second one in the Sydney region is a meat poultry farm. So, yeah, I mean, those are the main concerns that it could, if it goes a bit more widespread, affect the supply of, of food, uh, their um, poultry products. But as far as concerns about health to the general public, those are remote. There's no evidence that the types of virus that have been detected in the flocks in New South Wales, Victoria or Western Australia are so-called human pathogens. They are strictly bird-affecting flus. There have been reports that there can be some transmission to humans, but very, very rare, and only for people who are in close contact with live infected birds. But the general public should not be in that situation. Can you explain to us what bird flu is and how it impacts birds? It's one of the many types of flus. I mean, we think of flu as being a respiratory infection that we see circulates in the community every season. So human flu is just one of the many types of flus that are out there. And flu, the flu virus infects pretty much all mammals um, and birds. But the types that infect the other species, the mammals and the birds, don't normally infect humans because we're all, all viruses are what's called host specific. So they prefer a particular host to infect. So human flus infect humans very well. Bird flus infect bird very well. And all the other species of flu that get into other animals infect those very well. On the rare occasion, flu can transmit from animals into humans, very similar to what we saw with coronavirus a couple of years ago, when originally it was a bat virus that seems to have gone through a secondary host and then finally into humans. But that's really a, a rare event and only happens in situations where you get new versions of the virus, you know, the so-called variants that, that emerge. So for the most part, human viruses infect humans and that's pretty much it. On occasions, bird viruses can infect humans, but we are referred to as a dead-end host. That means the virus doesn't grow very well in, in us. So the transmission to other people is very, very unlikely. And in fact, for most situation where bird flu has infected people, those people themselves become sick but can't transmit the virus to other people. So the risk to the general population is, is quite low. What is the impact on humans if they do get a strain of avian influenza? Is it deadly? It's the same as we get for other forms of flu, you know, respiratory infections, um, conjunctivitis, those sort of conditions. And in, in the case of the one that we're more concerned about, the one that we refer to as H5N1, which has been causing outbreaks throughout the world um, and has also infected cattle herds in, in the US, which is potentially a concern, but at this stage, there's no evidence of H5N1 in Australia. That one can be quite deadly. And, and in fact, for the for people who have been infected with H5N1 in the past, it's got about a 50% mortality rate. So it is, it is of concern, but again, it's rare. It doesn't happen as commonly as the regular seasonal flu. Next is, I suppose, the heart of the problem, which is our producers, our farmers, um, you know, who have these flocks. How do they deal with an outbreak? Does it mean that they can't sell their eggs or their chicken? Yeah, well, as, we, as we've seen, those you know, quite disturbing images of birds being euthanised and, and having to be disposed of, and that just cuts out the, that large number of, of hens from the laying population of eggs and for the broiler chickens, the one that we, we eat, that population also is diminished if it gets into an egg, uh, a poultry meat producer, which it has in this particular farm, um, second farm in, in the Hawkesbury region. So, yeah, there's no rule other way to, to deal with the problem but to cull the, the, the birds in that particular farm because, as we've seen, even that doesn't often or doesn't always stop the transmission. And the reason is because the bird flu is actually carried by wild birds, not by domestic birds. So the wild birds, obviously, you can't control them. Uh, they fly around and, and flu in birds is a bit different to flu in mammals and humans. It, it's predominantly a, a gastrointestinal infection, so it causes things like diarrhoea. Um, so when birds are doing their thing, their poo, they can spread the virus by that means. So as they're flying over a farm, you know, potentially they can poo on over that environment and other birds in the area become infected. 
I want to put this into perspective in that it's 10 farms across Australia uh, in the three states, Victoria, New South Wales, WA. So it's a very small number of farms Mm. that have been impacted. But I think the question that I'm seeing is, can we still eat chicken and eggs in Australia? Or is there a risk that we could be infected if the bird that it came from had bird flu? Yeah. And and again, that's quite a rare remote possibility. The farms that are infected, affected a, a quarantine and no produce can leave those farms. If, and this is a big if, that any um, infected eggs or poultry happen to get into the food chain, well, the virus is killed easily by cooking. So there's no risk to consumers if they cook their eggs and their poultry meat properly, which they should do anyway. We don't advocate eating undercooked chicken and raw eggs. So if people to take the regular precautions of food hygiene and and other practices in the kitchen, then there's no there's no harm. And remember, of course, flu in humans is a respiratory infection. We don't get it from eating food. We get it from someone else or some other thing, you know, coughing it up or sneezing it onto us. You wrote a piece about this and I was reading it and you said, um, don't wash your chicken. Now, I mm. found this interesting because <laughs> I don't know anyone who does this right, but I'm a, I'm a lover of TikTok and Americans particularly love to wash their chicken. What's the risk if that's what people are doing? Yeah, it's like anything which is a raw product in the kitchen. Um, you know, chickens carry other types of, of microbes, bacteria. It's rare again, but they do carry things like salmonella, E. coli, um, another one called Campylobacter, which is quite common in chicken. Now, all these are gastrointestinal so-called pathogens, they can cause things like diarrhea and even more serious consequences. So if you're washing your raw chicken breast or carcass or something under the the kitchen tap, it's possible you you can splash droplets of that water across the kitchen to other surfaces. And those droplets of water will carry potentially bacteria. And there have been studies that have shown that you can detect these bacteria spreading from the chicken carcass to other parts of the kitchen if you apply a stream of water from your from your tap. Um, that's the risk that you spread the the bacteria to other parts of your kitchen, which you don't necessarily know about. Don't clean properly, perhaps you handle it with, with other things, and so yeah, you can just cross contaminate those things across across other areas of the kitchen. So if you must wash your your chicken, it's advised that you might want to do it in a say a, a sink full of water, um, minimise aerosols, minimise splashing, and those sort of activities. Professor, before we let you go, obviously this is an issue that is being contained at the moment. As you've explained, the risk to the general population is pretty pretty rare as it stands. But, you know, uh, the response has been important mm. by all levels of government to ensure that it doesn't become worse. Have you been satisfied with how it's been handled so far? Well, I think the actions that have been taken are the same as that have been taken in the past when we've had bird flu outbreaks and they seem to contain the, the outbreaks to those localised areas. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that we're doing the best thing that we need to do. And unfortunately for the farmers that are infected, you know, that's an economic loss to them. But for the general population, unless you're in that environment directly, the risk is, is minimal. Professor Enzo Palombo, thank you so much for your time today. We do appreciate it. My pleasure, Sasha. Thank you. That was Enzo Palombo, Professor of Microbiology at Swinburne University. And that is all for this episode of The Briefing. Thanks so much for listening. A reminder, we put out full eps of our weekend briefing chats on YouTube. To see them, search Listener Newsroom. Don't forget to subscribe as well. And you can also see our other video content on TikTok at Listener Newsroom. We're also on Instagram, which is at The Briefing Podcast. And finally, before you go, if you liked this ep, why not share it with someone you think might enjoy it too? I'm Sasha Barbagat. We'll see you next time. Listener.